Thank you for being here this morning. I am so excited to get to teach this class. In some ways, this is the class that I wanted to teach when we started this series. Because so many people email me and ask me, what about this bizarre law from the Old Testament? Now, why is it that they weren't supposed to wear clothes of mixed fibers? Why is it that they couldn't eat pork? Or at least weren't supposed to. And, and different people have different explanations. I perhaps have told you about my very first Hebrew professor who was raised in an Orthodox Hebrew home in South Africa. And he and I were um, uh, eating lunch one day and we went up to the front of the deli counter and he ordered a ham and cheese sandwich. And I looked at him and I said, Dr. Klein, you're not supposed to eat ham. And he was a short, little, wiry man, had wire glasses, wiry hair, and a wiry voice. And he stuck his finger up in my face. And he said to me, Moses never would have forbade ham if he'd tasted it the way my wife makes it. And we have different explanations for some of these unusual laws. And I get the questions, should we eat uh, ham, pork? Uh, you know, it's the other white meat, so we are told. And so it's part of what I want to cover today. Now, here's the thing. If you've not been in our class, just as by way of background, we're looking at the biblical law as a reflection of the character, concerns, and plans of the lawgiver. And, and that's the way it is with all law. Law is a reflection of the care, the concerns, the priorities, the plans of the lawgiver. And so with that, let me pause for a moment because I failed to tell you Happy New Year. Now let me get back to the lesson. What I've done in this class is I've taken the laws and I've said in terms of them reflecting the character of God, we can see how we can put them into different buckets. We can put into one bucket the concerns and characters and plans of God that are represented by the ceremonies he told Israel to follow. Another bucket that's sort of part of that, the atonement process that Israel was instructed on. The Ten Commandments in themselves are a reflection of the character of God. There's a whole bucket that I plan to talk about next week. I call the get-along bucket, where it's, these are the laws you need just to get along with each other. But the bucket that I really want to zoom in today are not the ones that we've already covered and not the one that I'm going to do next week, but I want to look today at the national laws and I want to scrub those with you. And what I mean by national laws are those laws that seem to have been particularly written for Israel that, that, that made Israel who they were made them distinct from the other nations. And so I want to scrub those laws, but I want to do it looking for how they reveal the character and the concerns of God, which is the ultimate goal of the class. So I want you to scrub them with me, and here's the way we're going to do it. Three scrubs. First, I want us to make sure we all understand the unique features of ancient Israel. How many of y'all lived in Israel, say, 1200 B.C.? Okay, we don't have many. And so that's why we need to make sure that we understand the unique features of those ancient people. Second, I think we're going to see the key to this entire class is holiness. And I want to discuss that with you. And then the third scrub will be how does this apply to me? Does this mean I don't eat pork? Does this mean I can't wear a jacket that's got 
more than one fiber in it? <clears throat> Let's look at this together. So we start by understanding the unique features of ancient Israel. Now I took a satellite map with modern place names to help us understand where we are. And here it is. We've got Egypt. We've got Israel right in here. Lebanon is north. This is Syria. This whole area of Iraq and into a little bit of Iran is Mesopotamia. Now, cultures, think about the growth of cities for a moment. Um, if you are a farmer living on a farm, you may have some folks around you who work on the farm with you. But that's a lifestyle unto itself. If you're a, a nomad who, who has a sheep and you shepherd your flocks and you just move wherever the food is, that's a lifestyle unto itself. It may have a camp that goes with it, but those ancient cowboys were out roaming the prairies with their herds. In a city, things are different. When people congregate into a city, development happens in a different way. You can start having people specialize in what they do. One person can be the baker for a lot of people. One person can run the store for a lot of people. You begin to consolidate and, and live close together and the protection is different and you might build up walls, but you begin to settle in to one area and you start to educate and you start to diversify and you start to specialize and, and, and with that grows up a culture and an identity and a population that is more than a farmer, a rancher, or a nomad. You got it? Now the problem is, where do these cities arise in civilization? They arise where there are resources. The reason Jericho exists as a city is because there's a spring there that provides water. The reason civilization really starts in this area of the world, China is it's, it's, its own place. I don't, I'm not including the Far East. But in this area of the Near East or the Middle East, you've got Egypt with the Nile. That's always going to supply water. It's always going to flood. It's always going to make for crops. And so people can settle along the Nile reliably and they don't have to move every day. The same is true over in Mesopotamia. So you've got a culture here in Egypt. This is all desert. This is not city. You might have an oasis here and there that's featured in a James Bond movie, but this is by and large dry, arid, maybe someone's moving around some goats type stuff. But over here in Mesopotamia, you've got big empires that grow up. You've got the, the Syrian empire, Assyrian empire. You've got massive groups of people, even up in Turkey, massive groups of people that develop down in Babylon, that develop in this area because they've got water and an ability to farm as opposed to just moving around everywhere and bring things into city for people to eat. Now you've also got the same thing happening over here. And these people come in by sea. Well, look at the uniqueness of Israel. Israel, if the Egyptians want to go fight the, 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 the Assyrians, they got to go through Israel. If the Assyrians want to conquer the Egyptians, they got to go through Assyria. When the boat peoples want to go find a new place and they leave Crete on boat, they can come into Egypt or they can come in by Israel. By the way, that's where the Philistines came from. They were boat people. So Israel is this bridge, if you will. It's a highway. All roads from Egypt to there go through Israel. All roads from there down to Egypt go through Israel. 
the conquerors from overseas are coming into Israel. They tried to come into Egypt and got pushed back. But they were able to settle on the coastal region of Israel, the Philistines. Now, that unique location for Israel means that Israel is always going to struggle to be its own nation. Because everybody wants Israel. Everybody wants that land. You control that land and you control all access points. And so anybody, look, look at the city of Salzburg. You know, it grows up. I was talking to Marius, a young German exchange student here beforehand, and he's from Berlin. I don't know Berlin, but Salzburg, they kind of speak German, don't they? Yeah. Salzburg is, Salz is salt. And they had a salt mine there. And they had a river there. And so the salt mine is one where that river is the highway and it allowed the salt to get traded. And so Salzburg grows into a mighty financial city. Venice grows into a mighty financial city because it's right there on the water. And the boats can come in from the far east and the, 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 the trade can go out throughout all of Europe through the port of Venice. These cities become things where they're either going to be strong unto themselves or they're going to be conquered by someone else. And that's the unique situation for Israel. And if you want this whole class in a nutshell, it's this. A city set on a hill can't be hidden. Israel is not going to be hidden. It's going to be seen by all of the the surrounding peoples and its value is one that's going to make them want to conquer it so what God said for Israel is I'm going to put you into this land very valuable land you will be the possessors this will be your land but when you're in it you need to live by these commandments this is the way you need to do it. This is so Israel will stand out from every other country there is. Every other group of peoples. Israel is to stand out. And the idea is if Israel will stand out from all the rest, then everyone will know the reason Israel occupies that critical piece of real estate isn't because they're strong, isn't because they can take out the enemies. Isn't because they can stand up against the armies of Pharaoh or the armies of the Assyrians. The reason Israel exists and is strong and stands out from everybody else and is not to be conquered is because God is theirs and they are God's. Not they are God's, but they belong to God. That's, that's the whole thing. They, they are to be there as a witness to the glory of God. So that everybody says, man, how do they exist? They're so small. We should be able to just run right over them. Oh, no, 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 no. The God who pulled them out of Egypt, they were so strong, Pharaoh couldn't keep them. You don't want to mess with them. They've got a God who takes care of them. In fact, maybe we should get to know that God. That's the way this is set up. That's the plan. Look at Exodus chapter 20, verses 22 through 25. Now, Exodus 20, this is the Ten Commandments section. So we're just down past the Ten Commandments here. And God's talking here, and he says the following. Let's get this. The Lord said to Moses, Thus you'll say to the people of Israel, You've seen for yourselves I've talked with you from heaven. So don't go making a god out of silver to be with me. Don't make for yourselves gods of gold. An altar of earth you shall make. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's not done. An altar of earth you shall make for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings. 
Now, look at that. What's it about earth? Don't make something out of gold. Don't make something out of silver. Well, but earth? Who made the earth? He says, use what I made. I'm not an invention of humanity. I'm the creator of the world. Now, if you want to make an altar of stone, that's fine. You can build it, but not of hewn stones. Not of stones you've cut, you've shaped, you've fashioned. Just use natural stones. If you wield your tool on it, if you make it, you make it profaned, ordinary. Don't do that. I mean, this is, look at Deuteronomy 28. This is one of the last speeches Moses gives. Deuteronomy 28, and I mean, this goes on for a ton, the whole thing, but let's just start with the first, <laughs> we won't read the first 14 verses, but that's this first section. If you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, if you're careful to do all of these commandments, if you will be his unique people, if you'll stick out like a sore thumb, if you will follow all of these laws, including these national laws, that God sets, then God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. You are going into this land. If you'll follow these laws, I'm going to make you high above all the other nations. These blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord. You'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the field. You'll be blessed at home. You'll be blessed in the crops. You'll be blessed in the herds. The, the blessed will be your basket and your kneading bowl. Your bread's going to rise. Your yeast is going to work. Blessed will you be when you come in, when you go out. And your enemies who rise against you, those that come in, God will wipe them out. God will defeat them. They'll come out against you one way and flee before you in seven. This is what God will do. He will command the blessing on you and your barns and all you undertake. He's going to bless you in the land the Lord God is giving you. He will establish you as a people holy to himself. This is who you are. And all the peoples of the earth, look at this, all the peoples of the earth shall see that you're called by the name of the Lord. They'll be afraid of you. You'll abound in prosperity. The Lord's going to open up to you as good treasury. All of this, if you'll do what he says and you're careful to keep his commandments. I mean, that's, that's what it was. This was Deuteronomy 28, 14, 1 through 14. This is God saying it very clearly. I'm putting you in a place where if you're careful to do all that I've said, everyone's going to say they're special. God made them special. The pity is that almost all the time Israel just wanted to be like the other nations. They didn't want to be special. They thought the other you know, the, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. That adage comes about because that seems to be human nature. We want what we don't have. We take for granted what we do have. And God says, I mean, you read Deuteronomy 28, it's like he will command the blessings. Their enemies will be defeated. He will set them in a land where all of the nations will fear them. And instead Israel is kind of like, whoa, whoa. We, we, we don't want to, we want to be like them. 
So with that, you understand the ancient, unique features of Israel, where they were, place and time. And remember, God says he will bless them for Abraham's sake, but he also says that out of the offspring of Abraham, he's going to bring the Messiah. So God's got a lot going on here. But the key to it is what we just read in, in this, where God says, the Lord himself, verse 9, the Lord himself will establish you as a people holy to himself. And that's the key word. Holiness is the key to understanding this. So with that, I know school's not started back yet, but it has here. Let's go to school. And let's talk for a moment about holiness. Now, holiness in the Hebrew is the word kodesh. Kodesh, holiness. Now, we think of holy in different ways because holy has entered into our vocabulary. And we have songs, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Early in the morning, our song shall rise to thee. And we talk about the holiness of God. And, and for many of us, that just seems to indicate moral purity. And that's what we often think of with holiness. But the root of the word is not centered in moral purity alone. This word kodesh means a, a wide range, but, but in that semantic range of meaning, we've got at the core apartness. Something apart from everything else. Set apart. That's the idea behind sacredness. Something that is sacred. Something that is consecrated is set apart for God. Or consecrated to something else. Set apart for something else. Dedicated. It's the same idea behind something being sanctified or made specially different than everything else. A good way to understand Kodesh, holiness, is to think of the opposite, the antonym. The opposite of Kodesh is kol in the Hebrew. Kol means common, everyday, profane, just ordinary. So holy is utterly unordinary, totally set apart, unique unto itself. The opposite of holy is just common, ordinary, every day. Let me show you a passage to help you see this. It's Leviticus 10.10. 10. And this shows you, a, this is a great passage for you to make a note on if you want to show you the difference between these two words and to help you understand one and then the other. Leviticus 10.10. 10. God tells um, Moses to tell the people. Um, actually, God's speaking to Aaron here, I think. You are to distinguish between the holy, Kodesh, that which is set apart, and the or common, I guess is the way it's translated here, the common, the chol, cholal, I think is the form of the word here, uh, between the unclean and the clean, the tamer and the tovel, uh, tavo, tavor, tavor, tamer and tavor, I think. The, the, they're opposites. Holy or common? Set apart or ordinary? Clean or unclean? That relates it to moral purity. So, within the framework of this, Israel is being told that there's something different than everyone else. That's what holiness is. Holiness means apartness. 
And this is the key for Israel with the commandments that God gave them. And this is a reflection of the character of God. Because God is holy. He's different than everybody else. He's set apart. And this is Exodus 15, 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, set apartness? Who's like you? Who's set apart? Who's in your class? Who's on your level? Who measures up to you among any gods that the people may think exist? Who measures up to God? Nobody. He's majestic in the way he's all by himself and apart from everyone else. He's awesome in his glorious deeds. He does wonders. That's holiness. Exodus 26 says, remember this passage? Maybe some of you. The veil will separate for you the Kodesh from the holy place, from the most holy. The Kodesh Kodesh. It's used the word twice. And you put the mercy seat of the ark in the most holy place. Ah, here's some paper. Let me show you what this is talking about here so you understand. So in the community of Israel, when they worshipped, you have the temple. And the temple courts, or the tabernacle at the time for Moses, but it becomes the temple. You've got the, the people are outside. Here's all of the people. But there is a holy priesthood. What does holy mean? Apart. So there are some priests that are set apart that are allowed to go into the temple or into the tabernacle courts. And there's a tent that was built. This is what the temple becomes. And in the tent, there is a set-apart place. It's called the holy place because it is set apart. It's set apart from every other place. And only certain people can go in there, people who are also set apart or holy for that place. Now, there's a curtain in there, a veil. And that curtain, I'll make the curtain kind of red there that curtain separates out the kodesh kodesh the holy holy place the set apart set apart place so this is the setest apart <laughs> the setest apart place where only once a year only the high priest gets to go by the way, this is the veil that Christ's death caused God to tear from the top down. Because access is now for all of God's children. Because all of God's children are holy. Set apart. So this is the set apart of the set apart places. And that's what holy means. It's the holy of holy holies. Let me give you another passage. Here's Exodus 28 2. You'll make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty. What does that mean? This isn't everyday wear. These are the special clothes he wore when and, and his sons wore when he ministered before God in the tabernacle. So they're set apart clothes. It was his Sunday best. How about Leviticus 19 now? The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the people of Israel and you tell them you will be holy for I the Lord your God am holy. I'm set apart. You're going to be set apart. Israel, you're going to be unique. You're going to be different than all the nations. You're going to be a reflection of me. People are to look at you and say, that is what Yahweh is like. So the idea was for Israel to stand out from the rest. 
to the glory of God and as a witness to God who also stood out from all other gods. Am I making sense? Look at Leviticus 22, 31 and 32 with me. So you shall keep my commandments. Keep these laws. Do them. I'm the Lord. And don't profane. Remember, that's the opposite. That's chol in Hebrew. That's the opposite of holy. Profane just means ordinary. Don't treat ordinary my set-apart name. Don't treat me like every other God. That I may be set apart. Sanctified is still Kodesh. Among the people. It's set apart. I am the Lord who sets you apart. So he's saying, do the law. The law is a reflection of my character. And it will make you Holy, even as I am holy. You will be set apart. You'll be different than the nations. To my glory, God says, as you reflect me to the people. Everybody will be scared to death because of me. They will be afraid of you, Israel. And the Proverbs and throughout the Bible, it says that the fear of God is the beginning of understanding. When you begin to realize this stuff is true, you really start growing before the Lord. So many of these laws marked Israel as holy, different than the nations. And there are laws that simply are there with that drive and purpose to show that Israel is different than everyone else. A city that's set on a hill can't be hidden. Now, let me give you some examples and give you some to chew on and give you some to think about. Diet. Leviticus 11, 1 through 44 has a bunch of dietary laws. What you can eat and what you can't eat. But look at these laws, the way they're set out. By God to Moses. Leviticus 11. The Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and tell them, These are the living things you can eat among all the animals on the earth. This is for the people of Israel. Whatever parts the hoof is cloven footed and chews the cud, you can eat it. At porterhouse steak, go for it. Nevertheless, among those that chew the cut or part the hoof, don't eat the camel. It's unclean. Don't eat the rock badger. Mm, that's what I was going to have for lunch. Um, because it chews the cud but doesn't part the hoof, it's unclean. Don't eat Bugs Bunny. Because it chews the cud, doesn't part the hoof, it's unclean. Don't eat the pig. Don't eat uh, of the flesh of the pig. In the waters, here's what you can eat. It's got to have fins and scales. It means you can eat the bluegill, but you can't eat the catfish. It means you can't eat shrimp. Anything in the seas or rivers that doesn't have fins or scales, it's detestable. You're not going to eat it. And these things you shall detest among the birds. You can eat chicken. You can eat turkey. But don't eat the eagle. Don't eat the buzzards. Don't eat the kites. Don't eat falcons. Don't eat ravens. Don't eat an ostrich. Don't eat an owl, a cormorant. Please kill the cormorant, but don't eat the cormorant. Those will destroy fisheries. Sorry. You're not allowed to kill them, so I take that back. That was not legal advice. They're protected. Uh, don't eat all these owls. Herons. Don't eat bats. Now, winged insects. 
Sorry, no go. Now, by these, uh, it keeps going. I'm, I'm going to not get into, we don't have time for all of this, but you can read about mice, geckos, uh, great lizards. Uh, it goes on and on. What I want to do is get to the bottom end of this, which is verse 45. So don't defile yourselves eating any of this stuff. Why? 45. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. So you're going to be set apart because I'm set apart. Don't eat these things because they won't make you Israel. They'll make you like everybody else. Did you know when an archaeologist is digging over in the Holy Lands and they find an ancient city or a level within an ancient city? Do you know how they can tell in those border cities between Israel and Philistine, Philistia? Do you know how they can tell whether the people were Israelites or Philistines? They look for the presence of pig bones. Today, that's how they know. Because pig was like major food for the Philistines. It's like, I mean, pork roast for lunch, baby. But the Israelites didn't eat it. And they'll find tons of pork bones, pig bones, in the civilizations that aren't Israel. But in the Israeli civilizations, they don't find any pig bones. Archaeologists today still identify Israel, the Israelites, by the diet. It set them apart as someone different. How else? Clothes. That's the Leviticus 19.19 passage. I don't have time to get into it because we've got to get to the third scrub. But it set them apart. They can't just wear clothes they import from somebody because they're mixed fibers. Israel's got to make their own clothes. And they make them special, different than all the others. If it's going to be made of linen from the flax and the, 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 the plants of the Nile, great, you get a linen shirt, but it's not a linen cotton blend. Circumcision. If you go back to the first book of the Torah, Genesis 1711, God says to, Moses, uh, to, to Abraham that circumcision is going to be something to set them apart, his offspring, from everybody else. 1711. You'll be circumcised. In the flesh of your foreskins, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. It indicates that God has made a special relationship. And oh, it goes further. Deuteronomy 36 takes it even further. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, God says the following. Actually, it's Moses talking about God's forgiveness when they repent. And he said, Moses says, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring. So you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul that you may live. Circumcision was a mark of uniqueness, of a covenant set apart for a covenant. Now, we've been talking about the laws of Israel that set Israel apart from the other nations. But the offspring of Abraham bore their own mark to set them apart from the other peoples. Israel didn't have a king initially. And if you read 1 Samuel 8 where they start wanting to get a king, the point is God says, hey, they're not happy with me being their king. They want to be like all the other nations. But here's the problem with the king. And it shows that the way God set things up would have worked great if Israel had done their part. But Israel wants a plan B. They want to be like the other nations. And God says, well, here's the problem you're going to have. 
And sure enough, it happened. Now, there are other laws that you can look at and you wonder, is this law one that earmarked Israel? For example, the commandments of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is often called the Shabbat Kodesh, the Holy Sabbath. What does it mean, holy? Set apart. The Sabbath was a set-apart day from all the other days. How many days of the week are there? Can you name them? What is the name? What are the names, Miss Carolyn? Sunday? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Answered like a fine young lady here in the U.S. of A. But not answered like a Jew in Israel. Because Israel doesn't have names for the days of the week. Except for one. The Sabbath. Do you know what the first day of the week is called in Israel talk? First day of the week. Do you know what Monday is called? Second day of the week. Tuesday, third day of the week. Wednesday, fourth day of the week. Thursday, fifth day of the week. Friday, sixth day of the week. Saturday, Sabbath. Holy Sabbath. Set apart Sabbath. It's set apart. It's different than all the others. It's got a name. That's why in the New Testament it says, it doesn't say on Sunday they went to the tomb. It says on the first day of the week. That's what they called it. Okay. So some would argue that the Sabbath was a particular command to set Israel apart. They are to honor it. And it belongs in the national law bucket. Some would say no. But it certainly did set Israel apart. I'm not going to answer the question for you. I'll let you decide. You, you study it, pray about it, pay your money, take what you get. But I will tell you this. Remember, water sloshes among all these buckets. Just because something is a national law doesn't mean that it's not also a ceremony. Doesn't mean that it's not also, whoops, I messed up. That national law bucket needs, one of those need to be a get-along bucket. Doesn't mean it's not, the water sloshes along. But the idea is still the same. For the national laws, the idea was for Israel to stand out from the rest to the glory of God and as a witness to God who stood out from all the others. And when Israel acted like all the others, it failed to properly reflect God's nature. Remember, the laws reflect the nature of God, including the fact that God is different than everybody else. He's set apart. He's unique. So his people should be set apart. Now they can't be set apart in the same way God is because we're not God. But he gave us rules, or Israel rules, to set them apart so that people would understand that God is holy and God is different. And they're uniquely God's. But when they start acting like everybody else, then the reflection that they are of God makes God look just like everybody else. They profane. They make him common. And God says, look, I acted. This is, this is let me I'll take it down for a moment. Remember, Israel profanes God. They become like the nations. They lose their holiness. They lose that set-apartness. And God visits judgment on them. Because he says, I'm not going to let you trash my name. I'm not going to let people think that's who I am. I'm not going to let people think I'm ordinary. That's not who I am. So if you're going to be that way, that's fine. But I'm just sending the nations against you. You want to be like them? Let them have you. You won't be that special place if you're not going to honor me and reflect me. Now within that, Ezekiel the prophet, after Israel's been carted off into captivity, or Judah, excuse me, says, I acted, this is God, I acted for the sake of my reputation. 
that it shouldn't be profaned in the sight of the nations. In whose sight I brought Israel out. I brought you out of Egypt to be special, to be my bride, to be unique to me, to hold you and to nurture you and to take care of you. And you trashed it and you decided you wanted to be like all the other countries. That's fine. But don't, if you're going to treat me as common, don't think I'm going to treat you, let you trash my reputation. Because God's about something much greater than how someone feels on a certain day. Amos said it this way, God brings judgment because his holy name, holy, set apart name, is treated kol. Kadosh is treated kol. Because it's holy, but it's treated ordinary. So he's going to come in judgment. Holiness was the key to understanding this. Now, last section to scrub. How does this apply to me? Well, remember, Jesus comes. Jeremiah said that he's going to produce a new law and write it on our hearts. Now, the character of God's never changed. But how that character of God is expressed through Jesus and after Jesus, alters some of the legal instructions that were given to Israel. It just does. So how does this apply to me? Jesus is the one who said a city set on a hill can't be hidden. And the followers of Jesus Christ should also stand out from all the rest of the peoples of this world. To the glory of God and as a witness to God who stands out from all others. I was talking to Marius before we started, the German exchange student. I said, how different is it here than in Germany? He says, you got a lot of Christians here, uh, much more so than in my school in Germany. And they're all so nice. (laughs) Praise God! I'm so glad he didn't say, you got a bunch of nasty Christians here that are mean. God brings his judgment because his holy name is profaned. We're to be holy. We're followers of Jesus. We're to stand out. We are to be apart. Peter says it this way. As he who called you is set apart, you also be set apart in everything you do. It's written, you shall be holy for I am holy. He's invoking Leviticus 11, I think verse 44. He's invoking the law. This this is the whole point God made to the people. You be set apart because I'm set apart and you reflect me. And so Peter says we need to be that way in our conduct. In the ways that God is set apart, here's one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. It's Isaiah 57, 15. Thus says the one who's high and lifted up. By the way, high and lifted up. That image alone is holy, set apart. Everyone else is down here. He's high and lifted up. He is set apart from all the others. He inhabits eternity. Where do you live? Eternity. Whoa. Location, location, location. That's good real estate. (laughs) Whose name, his reputation, his character, what he does, is set apart. Thus says the one who's high and lifted up, inhabits eternity, whose name is, is holy. Here's what he says. I dwell in the high and apart place, holy place, Kodesh. But not only there. Look what he adds. And also with him who's of a contrite and lowly spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. We don't measure up. We're not not there. We haven't arrived. We, We only inhabit eternity because there's a God who brings the contrite to him who brings the lowly in spirit to him and abides with them that's holiness 
This is why Jesus said in John 13, 15, by this all people will know you're my disciples if you love one another. The world doesn't do that the way we do. We're the people of God are not supposed to be known by what color skin they have, by whether they have hair or a shiny head. Edward Fudge used to tell me as he balded in front of my very eyes, he said, God only made a few perfect heads. The rest he had to cover with hair. <laughs> Tom, you can hang on to that one. I, but that's not what makes you a Christian. You're not a Christian because you live in the South. You're not a Christian because of your political affiliation. You're a Christian because you belong to God. And that affects who you are, and that affects your priorities, and that affects how you live. But the world will see you based on how you love. That's the holiness. So Paul says, put on then as God's chosen ones, set apart from everybody else and loved by God. Put on compassionate hearts. Put on kindness. Put on humility. Meekness. That's that contrite spirit, lowly in heart. Patience bearing with one another, forgiving each other, and above all these, put on love. Oh, there's so much more, but we don't have time. I'll just leave you with this. I told you water sloshes among the buckets. Get a load of this on holiness. Look at this passage from Exodus 29. Seven days you'll make atonement for the altar. It's telling them how to get the altar ready to worship God. Seven days you'll make atonement for it and consecrate it, set it apart. And the altar shall be Kodesh Kodesh, most holy. And whatever touches the altar shall become holy. That altar was a foretaste, a foreshadowing of the true altar of sacrifice for our sins which was the cross of Christ. And God says from the very beginning, He says, coming into contact with the altar of God is what will make you set apart. It's what will make you holy. You got that? Look back. Seven days you make atonement for the altar, consecrate it. The altar will be most holy. It represents the sacrifice of Christ. And whoever touches the sacrifice of Christ shall become holy, set apart. You are different when you belong to Christ. And with it comes the peace that passes understanding. And with it comes forgiveness. And with it comes dwelling with the Almighty for eternity. Got it? Let's go to church. Uh, but before we do, let me bless you. Father, holy God, set apart God, sacred God, may we be a holy people that reflect your uniqueness, your greatness, your love, your compassion, your care for the least, your desires for, for love and kindness. May we reflect that, Father. And not profane your name among the peoples. We pray in and through that sacrifice of Christ, touching the altar. Amen. See you guys next Sunday. Thanks for being here. Happy New Year.